Today's Bible reading is from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. The Sabbath rest for the people of God. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day God rested from all his work. And again in the passage above he says, They shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest. And those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore God again sent a certain day calling it today. When a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before. Today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Well, welcome back to our series in the book of Hebrews. Today I want to talk to you about rest. And I want to ask, do you crave rest? I, I think you probably do. In fact, I think maybe we all do. Whether we work or study, whether we're retired, whether we're at home, we look forward to rest, to breaks, to, to going home at the end of the day, to relaxing. When we've been working, we look forward to holidays, those longer times of rest. We always want more sleep, don't we? more downtime to do those things we enjoy. I, I can confirm as well as a young parent, the value of rest in my life has gone up since, um, since Heidi was born. To have solid rest times, it almost seems like the daily goal. In our household, rest can be quite elusive with uh, both Heidi and Joseph around. I know when Heidi goes down for her afternoon rest time, that kind of hour and a half, two hour window uh, is very precious, and particularly if Joseph's not resting, uh, it can be a real drain to miss out on that rest. I feel like rest is a thing that we all crave, and yet generally we can't get enough of. Well, we do continue our he uh, Hebrews series today. He Hebrews is a book in the New Testament part of our Bible. It was written probably in the 60s AD by an unknown author, written to a group of Jewish background Christians living outside of Israel, possibly even in Rome, and it was written to show these Christians the centrality and importance of Jesus in what God has done. Today is the sixth message in our series, which means it's the final message of part one of this three-part series. Next week, we'll have a, a different sort of week, and then we'll begin the first message in part two. And within part one, today's reading is really the second half of a short sermon in Hebrews on Psalm 95. If you've got your Bibles, please have them open with you. It, it'll make more sense. You can see from chapter 3, verse 7, the author quotes Psalm 95 at length, and then he keeps referring back to it and explaining it all the way to chapter 4, verse 13. Last week, Brendan preached on the first half of this kind of mini-sermon in Hebrews from 
chapter 3, verse 7 to 19. Today I'll be speaking on the second half from chapter 4, verse 1 to 13. So it's kind of like now I'm doing a sermon about a sermon. Uh, hopefully it's not too confusing. But to get our bearings, I want to begin with the, the, the text of the Hebrews sermon. That is Psalm 95. So let me read from chapter 3 of Hebrews where he quotes Psalm 95. Chapter 3, verse 7 to 11. So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Let's try and make sense of this. Psalm 95 was written about the wandering of God's people in the wilderness. After God had, had freed them from Egypt, they wandered in the wilderness desert for 40 years before entering the promised land, the land of Canaan. And during that time of wilderness wandering, many of the people started to distrust God and were disobedient. And so during that time, God judged their disobedience. And part of that judgment we see in the psalm. Have a look at Hebrews chapter 3, 11, which quotes the last verse of the psalm. It is God speaking. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. I want to just take a moment and think about what life might have been like for those wandering Israelites. That They've been freed from slavery in Egypt, but now they're in the desert. 40 years they're wandering. What would rest mean for these people? When God says, they shall never enter my rest because of their disobedience. What was he denying them? Well, it certainly wasn't time. It's not like they were flat out super busy in the desert, doing lots of life admin or kind of juggling three jobs, doing all the pick up and drop offs from school for the kids or snowed under by sort of reports, due dates. No, they had plenty of time on their hands. At least hypothetically, they could relax. They could put their feet up. Rest can't just mean peace and quiet or you know, reading a nice book in the tent with a cool drink or something. It can't mean just doing nothing. The rest God referred to, the rest God was denying many of them, was actually entry into the promised land. Rest was really something like resolution, resolution to their wandering, satisfaction or completion. I want to suggest that in our present kind of COVID-19 restricted lives, we have a unique insight into this. Because we might also think, well, we've surely got more rest now, don't we? I mean, some of the usual things that take up our time are, are cancelled, they're on hold. We've maybe got more time on our hands. And look, maybe for some of you, you do feel more at rest, which is great. But I actually suspect in isolation, when things are cancelled, what we get is restlessness rather than rest. We're not settled. We're not kind of at peace with how things are in that sense. There's a sense of uncertainty. What's going to happen next could be changed week by week. We are restless for resolution to this kind of crazy ride. We just want it to be over, don't we? And we don't really feel like we can settle or, or breathe a sigh of relief until it is. Maybe our present restlessness is actually a little similar to wandering aimlessly in the desert. See, I think our desire for rest, for real rest, isn't necessarily about less activity. I think for us, like those wandering tribes, real rest means resolution. It means a return to normal, the end of lockdown, freedom to, to do what we want, work going back to normal, seeing our family and friends from Melbourne again. See, to at least some degree, we can appreciate that yearning for rest and resolution that the wandering tribes had. Well, maybe that's so far so good with the idea of rest, but the author, he pushes it a bit further. He suggests that the rest written about in Psalm 95 is about something even bigger. Now, this gets a little bit hard to follow, but um, hang with me as I kind of jump around a little bit. See, the thing is with this Psalm 95, it wasn't written down during the wandering times. It was written a few hundred years later by King David, once the people were settled in the promised land. And the author of Hebrews says 
rest in this psalm must have meant something relevant in the time it was written, during David's time, a few hundred years later. Now, we might think, why, why necessarily? I mean, isn't this just a historical psalm about past events? Why does a quote from God in that psalm have to mean something when it was written? Have a look from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 7 to 8. It says, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David. As in the passage already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. The author says when this psalm was written by David, David had a warning for the people of his time, which is why he wrote, today do not harden your hearts. See, that warning about either entering or missing out on rest was relevant for that time. So rest in Psalm 95 can't have just been about the entrance to the promised land, as, as referred to here by Joshua, who led them. No, it must have continued to have relevance. And in fact, the author suggests it has relevance even now. Rest in Psalm 95 wasn't just about entering the promised land, and it wasn't just extended to something in King David's time. It's something relevant for the first readers of Hebrews, those first Christians, and something relevant for us today. Listen to the language he uses. In verse 1 of chapter 4, Hebrews 4, he says, The promise of entering his rest still stands. In verse 3, he writes, We who have believed enter that rest. And in verse 6, it still remains for some to enter that rest. Throughout this passage, he speaks of rest as something that can be entered by people at all times. I want to suggest that the true, real rest he's speaking about here is eternal life, life with Jesus, which is why it's something presently available for all people, even now. Now, rest is not a common biblical image for salvation or eternal life. But it is used in one other place. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, in one of the great images that John receives and writes down, we read this. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Rest. Rest is an image for eternal life. Well, maybe the next obvious question is, what is heavenly rest like? And for us as followers of Jesus, this is a, a really important question. What, what are we looking forward to, perhaps? And to answer this, the author goes back to the first use of rest in the whole Bible, back in Genesis, when it speaks of God's rest from creation. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3 says this about God. His works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. As we know from Genesis, God made the world, <clears throat> and then on the seventh day, he rested. God's creation work is over. And the author says, suggests here in Hebrews that our heavenly rest might be somehow similar. Chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. He writes about a Sabbath rest for God's people, that we who enter eternal life rest from our labor, just like God rested from his creating work. And calling it a Sabbath rest, I think, kind of makes sense too, because God's rest from creation became the model for the Sabbath day's rest in the Old Testament, the day of rest on the seventh day. The author of Hebrews essentially says, this rest of God is something we can enter as well. So what does this look like? Well, I wonder what your picture of eternity is. Maybe you have a picture of kind of sort of lounging around on couches or maybe clouds, depending on your imagery. This might be a good time to kind of leave that sort of image behind for, for a few reasons here. Firstly, consider what rest looked like for God after creation was finished. Now, it certainly didn't mean inactivity. God is not a clockmaker deity who kind of winds up the world, does all the work at the start, makes it, and then leaves it to run, hands off, the work is done. No, God is intimately involved in creation, sustaining it, intervening, upholding it, and God is still involved today. God's restful state 
includes what God's doing now. It, it, it's active. It's still involved. Secondly, for humans, the Bible clearly distinguishes between good work and toil. So in Genesis chapter 2, in creation, we learn that before the fall, humans are given good work to do. In Genesis 2, uh, verse 15 and 19 to 20, we learn that humans were tasked with tending the garden and naming the animals. But after the fall, after humans disobeyed God and turned away from God, stopped trusting God, uh, work, good work, kind of got twisted a bit and became toil. It became labour with frustration. Chapter 3, verse 17, we, we read this uh, in the curse to the man. It says, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It's interesting, in our passage, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10, the word for works can also be translated labour. So you could read that verse, anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their labour. The image here seems to be that rest really means no more toil. And thirdly, and I, I admit this is a little speculative, but it's good to think about what the Sabbath looked like for Jesus. Jesus was certainly active on the Sabbath, wasn't he? Teaching, healing, caring for others. He wasn't lazing around. He was doing good. He was serving people. He was acting in love. So when we're looking forward to a Sabbath rest, as Hebrews says, I wonder if Jesus' Sabbath activities can be at least a little bit instructive. Where does this leave us? Well, in God's eternal kingdom, I want to suggest there will still likely be good things for us to do. It, it won't be boredom. Uh, it won't be restlessness. But it also won't be toil. Any work or activity we do will always be satisfying, never toilsome, never laborious. I don't know. Can you, can you picture this? It's hard to imagine, isn't it? Work without toil. See, all the work we do today is at least slightly spoiled by the fall, by, by the infection of human sin and evil. But maybe sometimes we get a glimpse of work without toil. Maybe it's that feeling you get when you finish a really satisfying, life-giving task, that sense of productivity combined with you know, a real restful satisfaction. Or maybe when you just kind of lose yourself in, in an activity you enjoy so much, something that really energizes you, doesn't even seem to drain you. Work without toil. Can you imagine it? Work without toil. Fully satisfying. Fully rewarding. I think what a wonderful concept of rest and of eternal life to come. The next question, of course, is how does someone enter this wonderful rest of God? Well, this might seem obvious, but I really want to unpack this. From last week's reading, I think you would probably be forgiven for thinking that entering God's rest is all about obeying the rules, God's rules. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 talks about the people who failed to enter as they rebelled, sinned, and disobeyed. And we even see this focus on obedience in today's reading. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 6 says that those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience. And verse 11 warns the readers not to perish by following their example of disobedience. Disobedience seems to be the clear reason that you could miss out. Disobedience, disobeying God. And this kind of makes sense. I mean, this is what happened in the wilderness, isn't it? God's people were given the law and told to obey and many of them did not. So we might be tempted to think, well, how do we enter God's promised, wonderful rest, eternal life? I guess we just got to follow God's rules. We just got to obey. But there's another line that runs through this passage, and that's the place of faith. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 19 is sort of the last verse of that, that section from last week, summarizing a lot of that passage about those who rebelled and were disobedient, and says the real issue was unbelief. It says, so we see they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. In a similar way, in today's passage, in, in verse 3, chapter 4, verse 3, it says, we who have believed enter that rest. And I think probably most firmly in verse 2, it says, for we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them 
because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. The writer says the good news, God's message must be combined with faith. And I think this verse, chapter 4, verse 2, is really helpful to show that link between faith and obedience. It suggests that genuine heart faith in God will be shown or demonstrated in obedience. See, the reason why some failed to enter the, the, the rest of the promised land was not specifically because of their disobedience, but because they didn't have faith in God, which leads to obedience. I'll read it again. The message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. See, obedience, law-keeping, is never the thing that saves. It's only God's grace, God's free gift of life in Jesus, which we receive not by works or by rituals, but by faith, by dependent trust in Jesus. And it's from a heart of faith that we are then called to be obedient, to live God's way. Obedience following God's way is only ever an outworking of the faith we have in God's grace. For the author of the psalm, for the author of Hebrews, obedience is, it's like evidence that a person has some faith. And this is the liberating message of the gospel, isn't it? Salvation by grace through faith. It was true then when Hebrews was written, and it's true now. And I want to say, since we're talking about rest today, this gospel message itself is actually also a message of rest. For any who feel shackled to legalistic works righteousness religion, the need to kind of fulfill all righteousness to to earn God's favour, the message of the gospel is rest. We don't earn our way into God's eternal life. We can't do it because of our wayward hearts, our tendency to worship ourselves and other things rather than God. We're so far from God. We can't earn his favor by our works, our obedience. No, but the good news of the Bible is that Jesus came and died in our place for our sake so that we could be brought back to God. And all we're called to do is to have faith, to trust in Jesus. And what Jesus has done for us. The gospel of grace is actually a message of rest. I was trying to think of a good way of uh, illustrating the relationship between faith and obedience that comes from faith. I was thinking about football supporting. So if you're a real fan of a footy team, if you claim genuine, genuine allegiance, it should show itself in some ways. At a bare minimum, you'd be watching your team's games on television. You'd know where they are on the ladder. If you're really committed, you might become a member. You might buy some of their merchandise. Now, I'm a Melbourne supporter in the AFL, but honestly, I'm lazy. I'm very lazy. I haven't watched a game in ages, not even on television. I couldn't even tell you where they are on the ladder right now. Uh, I could probably name two players in the whole team. You could look at my life and you could quite rightly question my allegiance. Now, the analogy is not perfect. But I think faith and obedience is similar. We don't earn our salvation through our church attendance, our Bible knowledge, our generous giving, our morality even, our acts of service. No, our salvation is a gift of grace. It's free and it's received by faith. But our faith should then impact our life, the way we live. And if your life looks no different, from anyone around you who who doesn't follow Jesus, if your life is just full of judgmentalism or sexual immorality, hateful language or greed, self-centeredness, lack of love and care for others, well, people would be right to look at your life and wonder, is faith really there? Just like footy fans could question whether I really do support Melbourne. Our obedience to God never saves us but it's evidence of the faith that we have in Jesus. Well, today's passage ends with a warning. Back in chapter 4, verse 2, the author emphasised God's word and said, we're in a pretty similar place to the Old Testament believers. The word was proclaimed to them and to us. It was no good to them because they didn't have faith. I'll read that verse again. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. 
The author is very clear. Just hearing God's word is not enough. Faith is needed. And there's a sense in which God's word, the message about Jesus, isn't just neutral news for us to kind of take or leave. It's a message of both judgment and salvation. Salvation for those who hear and have faith. Judgment for those who ignore its warning. The author picks up on this dual aspect of God's word by calling it a double-edged sword. Let me read those last two verses, chapter 4, verses 12 to 13, famous verses. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God's word, the message of the gospel, is double-edged. Both salvation and punishment are possibilities here. And the word of God, the gospel, it, it's incisive. It judges us. You could translate that judges as it's the critic of our hearts because it demands a response. You, you can't just kind of hear it and take it as interesting information. No, it says God sees and knows everything. Nothing is hidden here and his word demands a response. Well, what can we do with today's passage? I mean, it's interesting to consider eternal life as rest, but how is this relevant for us today? I want to ask, do we demonstrate the promise of rest that we have today? Do we demonstrate the promise of rest that we have today? Because I think that God's rest, as described in this passage, is a very attractive message for our time. Because people crave rest. People are restless and frustrated. People long for resolution. Maybe you've talked with some friends about dissatisfaction they have during this crisis. Maybe you know friends of yours who are longing for resolution, desperate to play sport again, to go back to work normally, to see family members, to travel freely. Rest is, is a felt need, but I think it's even more acutely felt at this time. Can we demonstrate the promise of rest that we have in Jesus? This might be a bit hard for us to think about because we're not there yet, are we? We're not fully experiencing God's wonderful rest now. We still work with toil, for example. And in our present crisis, there's maybe some other things that we crave more immediately. But I wonder, wouldn't it be great if our friends noticed us during this time and saw something that they wanted to have? An, an inner peace, a security in God, maybe a perspective that goes beyond this crisis. Not a denial of kind of today's frustrating reality, but a deeper sense of peace and rest. Let me suggest a couple of things we could do. Firstly, if you do find that you have more time during this crisis, maybe time that you get a bit restless and anxious, let me encourage you to spend some of that time with God. Read God's word, talk to God about what's concerning you. And thank God for the blessings he's given us. It's not going to necessarily just take away all our anxieties. But it means we know and we get in the habit of bringing our concerns before God rather than just letting them kind of stew in our heads. And secondly, I want to encourage you to think how you can crave God's eternal rest more than a vaccine. I think this is crucial. There's nothing wrong with looking forward to a vaccine or the end of our restrictions. But it can be good to remind ourselves of what life was like before the virus. It wasn't paradise. It was life with its ups and downs. And once this virus has been defeated, life will still look like this. Paradise is not when the virus is finished. Paradise is when Jesus returns and welcomes us into his heavenly rest. And as much as we want a vaccine, Jesus' return is the thing we should really crave. How would your friends, I wonder, describe you during these times? Are, are we restless? Are we irritable, sometimes angry, desperate for this thing to be finished? Or do they get a sense of our restfulness in God, that we have a deeper trust that goes beyond present trouble? I wonder, in our attitude, our tone, our approach, could we more closely hold to the promised rest we have through faith? Can we allow this to become obvious to others? Let me encourage you to pray for a deeper sense 
of God's promised rest. And that sense of rest within would become obvious without to others who see. So that they themselves might even crave the rest and peace they see we have. And that can lead to us sharing about the faith and the hope we have in Jesus. Well, today is the end of part one of Hebrews. And look, you can probably see the author doesn't sort of take his foot off the gas here to finish off. He is passionate till the end of this part about the need for faith in Jesus. Through encouragements and warnings, he points people again and again to Jesus. In today's passage, the author describes life with God as rest. Jesus offers this rest to all people. And it's rest, for, it's rest for good, rest with Jesus. It's not boredom or idleness. It's, it's good work without toil. And we see it to be received by faith in Jesus. Even accepting this gift of rest is a kind of restful thing. We, we don't have to strive, strive or, or toil to earn it. It's a gift we accept through faith. It's a restful message we read, but it's a serious one too. The author doesn't kind of sugarcoat the alternatives. The gospel calls for faith, which leads to rest, and it warns us about unbelief, which leads to death. Let me pray and let me thank God for his gift of rest to us, and that our lives might demonstrate this rest to all who would see. Let me pray. Lord God, I thank you for your word today in the book of Hebrews. Thank you for the wonderful image of rest that is presented before us as an image of what life is like with you, eternal life. Lord, in our present time, as we experience restlessness, frustration, perhaps anxiety, Lord, I pray that you would continue to work in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to find our rest in you. Lord, help us to look forward and crave that day when you'll return, when your rest will be fully established. And at this time, Lord, help us to live in a a sense of peace with you, not denying the frustrations of reality, Lord, but bringing them before you and trusting you with them. And Lord, I pray that our restfulness, our trust in you, our peace with you might be visible to others so they might, Lord, desire the rest that we have. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.